Then he says, the baptism with which I am to be baptized. Here we see deeply into what that which Jesus is too distressed about. Until it is accomplished, he's under pressure. The baptism with which he is to be baptized is his death. He uses the imagery of all the times also when James and John were fighting over positions in his kingdom. Jesus asked them, are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. This baptism Jesus is to be baptized with will be a most difficult and agonizing path of anguish and suffering. And Jesus can already feel its opening pangs throughout his ministry. How great is my distress until it is accomplished. It's, the tension is going to mount. His humanity is going to be shaken. This stress becomes almost unbearable. We all know what stress can do to us. The only sad thing about the way we live our lives is that we use dope just to reduce the tension of our stress. And when the drug ceases to function, our stress even gets higher. For Jesus, the torment is felt long before the whip lashes, the brutality of the judgment, the thorns on his head, the nails in his hands, and hanging on a cruel cross. He looks around, he sees those for whom he must endure this, and it includes you and myself. Hanging on the cross speaks to the quality of human temperament and human behavior, but yet it did not devoid or deprive the value of what God intended. He experiences a world fallen to such depth that only the death of God's Son can turn the cause of this world back into the paths of God. This was not only the pain of the cross he was going to suffer, there was also the pain of the distractions. His temptation was vivid. He had been hungry, and as a distracted method, the devil asks him to command stones to be made bread. Change your pattern, Jesus. All these things I will give to you. Our cross is not seen in the simplicity and the avoidance of what challenges us, our cross becomes vivid when we desire to go through the baptism of death and dying. Our call to the baptism of Jesus is not only an initiation right to a club or a exclusive club, but it is a call to stand witnesses to the changing and powerful and the power that God brings into the existence of our lives through our affiliations and association with this Christ. The calling to follow Christ demands a cross and demands suffering as well. I need to note that those who watched and listened to him would be divided over him. In today's world, many of us are looking for feel-good servants. Don't rock the boat. Don't, have, don't make anyone angry. What was there to suggest to them that he becoming more and more the despised and rejected of men was the one on whom they should pin their, their hopes and desires? Matthew attaches to these words of our text a further explanation note. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's a call to discipleship. Baptism, through what we understand, is a call to the deepening of our relationship with God, buried and rising to newness of life. To follow him was and is today to forsake attaching any ultimate importance to all that is most important in this world, 
in order to hold to that which is most important in the kingdom of God, which has come upon us in Jesus Christ. Jesus brings this into focus and recognizes that in our life the struggle continues. Our baptism is more or less a ritual through which we identify with, as I said, this exclusive club. It is not a call of denying oneself, taking up one's cross. It is not one in which we say, Thus saith the Lord. It is one in which we are silent when we must speak and speak when we must be silent. Jesus says, In this world, we will have tribulation, but be of good cheer because he has overcome the world. And the present suffering of this world cannot be compared with the glory. That is awaiting us. Jesus posed difficult or exposed the disciples to difficult situations when he said it was difficult, more difficult for a rich man to enter heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. To which the disciples asked, Then, Lord, who will be saved? The challenge for us in the 21st century is to recognize this call which more or less empties us of ourselves to identify with Jesus rather than to disunite ourselves with Jesus and be reunited with the world. You all know the division he speaks about is a division based on the authority of who he is. And any home or community that is practicing life with Jesus finds itself strangely um, in a subtle way, ostracized from the community. It happens within our families. When someone displays a particular attitude and you call their attention to scripture, what do they say? Don't preach on us. You can do what you like. I do what I like. Criticized. We stand up, we are criticized. Not so. We find ourselves struggling between what is right and what is wrong. What is absolute and what is a relative? We find this tension mounting around us even more in the 21st century, in which concepts have changed, meanings are shifting, and ideologies keep changing as well. The division comes because there are critical issues at stake. Here the relationship between God and humans are at stake, or is at stake. And not everyone is able to see that clearly. It is easier sometimes to keep quiet than to speak. And it is easier to conform rather than to stand up. In my experience, I notice that the conflict in the world in which we live today, it is the conflict with tolerance and compromise. <laughs> God calls us to respect the dignity of every person. Respecting every person does not mean we have to compromise our standard. And that is where we need to stand and be counted with Jesus. That I believe is what it will mean for us to take up our cross and to follow Jesus. To lose our lives so that we can save it. To find this connection with Christ who was without sin and yet he was crucified for your sin and mine. But then he changes the tone. The first part of the gospel is speaking to the disciples. Then he turns to the crowd. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, and when you see the south wind blowing, you say, you can make judgments on that. I don't know how many of you get what he said. Let me help you out. Ordinary everyday signs are read daily by those who are dependent on the skies, especially those who depend on the soil for their livelihood. Those who plant and want to harvest, watch the clouds, watch everything about nature. The only thing that is it's very troubling is that sometimes when you watch the, or listen to the weather forecast, 
They are as wrong as day and night. But yet we depend on them. But then he says, but why don't you interpret the present time? What time was he referring to? He was referring to the fact that even though the Jews had followed with diligence the signs of the coming of the Messiah, he is now with them and they have missed it. They could not interpret what was in front of them. The one sign of eternity present on earth, of all the past and of all the futures, yet to come gathered into one moment, is present here before your eyes, and yet you miss it. Do you not hear in what I say? Do you not see in what I do? And the things that are prophesied about the Messiah are the very things I do. You pay attention to the climatic changes, but you have missed it. Does in the Bible says when he comes, he will preach good news to the poor. He will set free those who are under bondage. He will open the eyes of the blind. He will declare the acceptable year of the Lord. You missed it. In his appearance, rises up and bears the promises that first arose in the dawn of the Easter morning. And that should be fulfilled in all glory when the sun sets again. You see the skies and read its signs. Look to me and see in me the signs of the Father's good will to provide redemption to all who come to me. Come and be embraced by the one whose reconciling hand reaches out far and near to embrace all of God's creation. We also are called to interpret the time, to interpret the signs that God continues to show us. Many of us keep asking the question, when is he coming back? Truth be told, I don't know. And thank God I can tell you I don't know. But one truth I can tell you, for each one of us, Jesus will come at different times. The time he will come for you will be different from the time he will come for me. Because when we breathe our last, time is up. This call to each one of us in this divided and decisive moment of our faith is challenged or exposed to us in the words of the epistle this morning. Therefore, being surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight that so easily beset us and let us run the race that is set before us looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. What is it Jesus speaking? I believe as he spoke then, so he speaks now. Judgment will come when we least expect it, because time is not forever. As we listen and as we live in our world today, I believe God is calling each one of us to take up our cross and to follow him daily. Amen. Amen.